the book of 2 Corinthians. And I have a little overhead I want to show you, because it pretty well spells out our lesson today. And sometimes uh, when we get together, things are happening, some good, some bad. But this here, I think you can get an idea of what we'll be talking about today. If you can't see it, it says, God loves the underdog. Why isn't that up there higher? I like that. God loves the underdog. And sometimes, against all whatever, we feel like that God has sometimes forgotten us. But he hasn't. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows who you are. And unbelievably, you know how many hairs you have on your head. Incidentally, it's still there. <laughs> and somebody was grabbing it today and asking, is it real? Yeah, it's still real. I have three people in here who have committed to pray for my hair. <laughs> I wouldn't lose my hair. Well, I want to tell you, I don't want to lose it either. The doctor is amazed that I still have it. So are the nurses. And I tell them, well, I got three girlfriends in my church that are praying for my hair. <laughs> he looks at me like... Where are you from? <laughs> and my wife, yeah. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 12. If you've got it, I want to read to you a, a, a lengthy little passage, but it kind of uh, sets the tone for our lesson today. It's the story of Paul. Now, you remember, uh, and i got to be sure I do this right now. Remember that some people here don't know who Paul was. And Paul is the writer of the majority of the New Testament. He wrote more books in the New Testament than anybody else. And he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He was on a horse. He was on his way to Damascus. And he was capturing Christians and taking them to prison and killing them. The families. And they put chains around them and take them off for the city. This was Saul. And so, lo and behold, God decides he wants to use this loser, <laughs> this underdog. And so God does a deal on him and meets him along the way. And you may know or may not know the story. And he lands on his can right on the ground. And God has a little conversation with him. So he not only changes his, 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 his mission, but he starts to serve God and he come, becomes a preacher. And he writes most of the New Testament. And this is who we're talking about. Now what he's saying here is the story he had about a visit to heaven. How many like to go to heaven? Uh, you want to go to heaven, but you don't want to die. I <laughs> mean, you know what I mean. And so we, we all we all like to have that little visit to heaven. Well, this is what this is what happened when he went to heaven. Here he's, this is what he says: It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. Interesting, he uses that word. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I don't know. God knows such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. How he's caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. That's amazing, isn't it? Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I forbear, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That means to beat on him, to irritate him. Lest I be exalted above measure concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. In other words, God, take this thing away from me. I'm tired of being buffeted. I'm tired of this battle. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that amazing? That, that, to me, that is so amazing. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Say it with me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, my wife has been reading a book, and this, while I'm putting this lesson together, she's reading a book, and it's written by a young lady called Joni Erickson, who is a woman who is paralyzed. And let me just say, I do not believe that this infirmity upon, G upon Paul was a sickness. That word infirmity does not mean sickness. If you're sitting there thinking that he had a sickness upon him, that is not true. If you get into the, into the Greek, it doesn't mean that at all. It means something to irritate you, a buffeting, something that's going on, always reminding you of your mistakes, always talking to you about the past. That's what the enemy does. And she writes in here, and it's just a, a little short blurb, but let me read it to you if I may. It says, society idolizes the power and prestige of a winner. We like winners, don't we? Yeah. Everybody, like, everybody likes Ken, Ken Griffey Jr., the baseball player. You know, everybody loves him. He was a winner. You don't know who he is, Betty? He was a guy that hit the ball, tried to hit the ball for the Mariners. They're not doing very well. But God's different. He loves the underdog. His divine, his divine favor rests upon people who die to self, defer to others, serve in humility, and sacrifice comfort, all for the glory of God. This rubs against human nature because we hate losing. We like to be winners. I like to be a winner. This intoxication with strength has even dulled the church. We're bent on building bigger, better, and more beautiful churches. We even gravitate to churches that are winning, whether it's an on-the-go youth group or a burgeoning building program. If we were God, most of us would grow a church by picking the smartest people to be on our team. Our strategy planning lessons would include Madison Avenue types, A-type personalities. We'd have our best public relations people doing focus groups. Weak people need not apply. Our gospel team would be smooth in speech and skilled in techniques. We would accept only the cream of the crop. Thank God we're not calling the shots. He is. And although there are aspects of winning that are good, God builds churches a different way. Jesus says, go out in the streets and the alleys, find the weak, make them come in so that my father's house may be full. God wants his house filled with inadequate and weak people. Isn't that amazing? He wants his house filled with inadequate and weak people. I am looking at this. And that way everyone focuses on the strength of the Lord rather than the skill and wisdom of men. Now there's a secret to this message today and, I, and as I'm putting it together I'm trying to figure out Lord what is it? I, I believe it's proven over and over again. Even in our opening text today that we just read that Paul writes so that he won't become big-headed. God sends a little remembrance, a messenger of Satan, to keep him humble. Now there's something here that we need to learn. I need to learn it, and you need to learn it today. Because the world loves a winner, and there are thousands of them. You can find winners in sports. Who wants to watch a team lose? How many love, oh, isn't that wonderful? The Mariners lost again last night. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, the Seahawks, they lost again yesterday. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, our soccer team is losing over in South Africa. Isn't that, no, we don't look that way. But God looks at things differently. And there's a reason for that. There's a secret here that I'm leading up to. I'm going to see if you can get it before I get there. In sports, business, bankers, medical field, finances, the list is endless of people who are winners. And we seem to gravitate in the natural toward winners. But it's interesting that God doesn't do that. And there's a reason for it. How do you feel about being the underdog? What does God see in them that you and I feel? What, what does God see in these people who are lame and weak and helpless and comfortable?